Welcome to episode 4 of the Norton Nemesis 1500cc V8 restoration. In this video we're going to be stripping the bottom end, removing the gearbox and clutch and lifting out the crankshaft and pistons. In the previous video I removed the cylinder heads. With the cylinder heads removed I undo all the sump bolts and then remove the sump. This pulls off quite nicely. I have a quick look up inside the engine and it all looks nice and clean and the filter gauze is also clean which is a good sign. I now loosen all the screws and remove the right hand side cover from the engine. This pulls off nicely as well with two little location dowels. And behind the cover is a one way starter clutch and starter motor drive gears. The starter motor is on the front of the engine held in place with two screws which I've already loosened so I now leave with that off. It's glued on with quite a lot of gasket cement. I next remove the starter motor idler gear shim and put that in my little tin with the rest of the parts. The one way starter clutch is held on with a relatively small M8 countersunk cap head and a special washer which I think is a bit marginal, but it's obviously done its job because the, the clutch seems to stay onto the engine for its limited use it's had. But, I, but when I take it off and have a quick look, I notice that the dowel is actually a roll pin, which is incorrect. It should be a hardened dowel. And it's slipped and moved around in the groove, jammed up tight. So this is going to be difficult to get off. While I think about the jammed on starter clutch, I'll move to removing the front sprocket. This is held up with a large nut in the center, which comes undone relatively easily. These can be very tight. I noticed that the nut itself is actually too long, so I'll machine that down later on before I refit it. The sprocket is quite tight on the shaft, so I use my three-legged sprocket puller to remove it from the shaft. This simply slips on the teeth and engages, and you the centre nut up tight, it pulls it off nicely. I made this sprocket puller when I was an apprentice over 45 years ago, and it still works just perfect. There we go, that's the sprocket off. So now I can go back to the clutch puller that I need to make. I've got a piece of aluminium, draw two holes in it, use two of the crankcase bolts, which is the right thread. So now I can screw the two bolts into the starter clutch. Just a few turns will do. Then I can put a socket in the center to distribute the load down onto the end of the crankshaft. Then when I do up the two screws, they just pull it straight off. And here it goes, lifts it up really nicely. It was quite tight. With the starter clutch removed, I can see that the taper is a really short taper. It's amazing it's actually long enough to do its job, but it seems to. So now I can remove the needle roller bearing, and put that safely back in the hole for safekeeping. The starter motor ride the gear. Behind the needle roller bearing is a circlet to prevent it hitting the gears. This seems to be quite badly damaged. In fact, there should be a shim between that and the needle roller, really. So I'll try and make one to fit. The circle is quite difficult to move off because it's damaged and it's jammed in its groove, but it eventually comes off. And here you can see how bent it is. I noticed there's quite a lot of play between the crankshaft and the camshaft first idler gear. This will cause it to clatter and rattle, which it does. I now spin the engine round and start removing the screws for the right hand side cover. There's quite a few of them. I have a quick check of the idle gear backlash on this side and it seems perfect, no play at all. So that's good. So now I can start taking off the clutch cover. This held on with many screws as well. With the screws loosened and the clutch cover removed, I can now start removing the clutch. 
this clutch is actually from a GSXR 750 Suzuki, and the springs are held in place by six screws. With the springs removed, I can remove the front pressure plate and then start taking the clutch plates out themselves. These are considerably rusty and they will need to be replaced. I use two small magnets to help get them out. It's not possible to remove the actual clutch from the engine with it in one piece, so next I start splitting the crankcases by loosening the screws. The crankcases are in three sections, the bottom, middle and top. Some of the screws along the front of the engine are quite hard to get to. I had to cut down my allen key to make it fit, there just wasn't enough room. It took quite a lot of time to get them out, you can only turn them a quarter of a turn at a time, and in the end I started using my fingers because it was quicker. This was a tricky job. It seemed to take forever, but I got there in the end. Well, that's the last screw out, so now I can lift the top crankshaft and piston assembly off of the gearbox. This is a really good design because you can actually separate the engine from the gearbox and leave the engine intact if you want to, and put that to one side and work on the gearbox and clutch without disturbing the crankshaft and pistons, which is really cool. I can now get to the last two remaining screws, and then I can separate the crankcases. The central crankcase now lifts off, revealing the gearbox cluster. The gearbox is six speed and taken from a GSXR 750. This just lifts out the crankcases now. The gear chain shaft has been extended to fit through the crankcases by welding two together. And it's quite a loose fit in its hole in the crankcases, causing it to wobble up and down. Another problem to rectify with the selector mechanism is that the D-dent return spring. This indexes the actual selector drum. The spring is hitting on the little lever, so this needs notching out to give some clearance. But we can do that later. Whilst I'm looking at the selector mechanism, I also notice that the oil pump drive gear is just resting on its shaft. Nothing holds it on at all. Just literally the back of the clutch rotating stops it from falling off, which is less than ideal. We'll have to sort that out later as well. I'm now getting lots of parts everywhere in my garage, so I need to have a bit of a tidy up before I can start doing the next bit of disassembly, which is moving the crankshafts and pistons from the upper crankcases. With the upper crankcase assembly on the bench, I rotate it round to gain access to the big end and main bolts. I start loosening the big end caps first, so I can remove one, one piston to have a look, see what it's like. The big end cap bolts have a very fine thread and take ages to unscrew. With the second bolt removed, I carefully remove the big end cap. This pulls off nicely on two little dowels. The surface of the bearing looks in good condition as well, which is good. So now I can push the connection rod up through the barrel to release the piston out the top of the engine. After a short push, the piston starts to come out the top of the barrel. I can grab it with my hand and pull it out nicely, being careful not to scratch the connection rods as I pull it out. The piston's a very short slipper piston. It appears to be in reasonable condition, but we'll be measuring that up later on. So for now, I'll put the return of bolts back into the connecting rod 
Just stay that nicely in my tin on the bench. So that's one down, seven to go. So now I can continue to remove big end caps from the remaining connection rods, unscrewing the screws by hand. Pulling off the caps, putting them in my tin, inspecting surfaces. Everything looks really nice at the moment, but we'll be giving it a thorough inspection later on when it's all stripped and cleaned. With the first two pistons and connecting rods removed, I need to rotate the crankshaft slightly to gain access to the rest. So I put an M8 nut and bolt in the end of the crank, do it up tight, and use this as an indexing point so I can easily turn the crankshaft. Things are very sharp, so you have to be very careful trying to turn it by hand because you can pinch your fingers very easily. It's quite a time consuming job removing all the big end caps, there's so many parts. But I just persevere, we'll get there in the end, and then the crankshaft will soon be out. I have noticed that some of the pistons feel slightly loose in the bores, but we'll be doing some measuring later on to find out how loose they are. As I lay the parts out on the bench, it's evident they're so clean and shiny, they've barely done any, any work at all. In fact, they look brand new. I've noticed quite a lot of black staining on the bores, but the crankshaft itself looks in mint condition. I haven't measured it yet, but it's very smooth and shiny, which is a good sign. With the last piston and connector rod removed, I can spin the crankshaft freely. So now I can loosen off the main bearing caps and lift the crankshaft out of the crankcases. The big end caps are numbered to match with numbers on the crankcases to ensure they return to their original positions. With the main cap bolts loosened, I spin them out by hand. The main cap then pulls off its location down, revealing the main bearing, which looks in reasonable condition. The main bearing surface is also very smooth and shiny, which is a good sign. With the last bearing cap removed, the crankshaft is free to lift from the engine. The crankshaft looks virtually brand new with no scores or scratches at all. With all, the, all the bearing surfaces are smooth and shiny, but I haven't marked them up yet, but we'll check them later. But initial indications are it's in excellent condition. So now I've noticed there's a couple of plugs I didn't remove, so I removed those from the cooling jacket. I also noticed two oil flow control jets, so I removed those too. They restrict the feed oil to the camshafts, maintaining oil pressure for the main bearing big ends. I noticed this gallery plug here, but I won't be removing that, it's been ground away. Not by hopefully by the engine running, this is done at the factory. And here you can see the bores, they're not as good as I first thought, but we'll be measuring those up later to see if they're recoverable or whether I need to replace them. These are wet liners that drop into the cylinder, so you can't hone them in situ, 
I've also just noticed there's a little crack in your gallery. This will need to be welded. And here's all the parts laid out on the bench for the V8 engine. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. In the next video, we're going to be measuring the bores, the pistons, and removing the liners from the block.